On this episode of China Unscripted, a Pulitzer Prize winning health expert joins us to talk about the Chinese coronavirus. She says tens of millions of people around the world could die, and the U.S. is woefully unprepared. So, what can you do with this deadly virus spreading? Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesha. Joining us today is Lori Garrett, a former senior fellow for global health at the Council on Foreign Relations, a Pulitzer Prize winning science writer, and author of The Coming Plague, Newly Emerging Diseases in a World Out of Balance. Thanks for joining us tonight. Hi. Well, so I know you won a Pulitzer Prize for your coverage of the Ebola outbreak in Zaire, uh, now Democratic Republic of Congo in the 90s. Uh, so I desperately need some good news. Please tell me the coronavirus outbreak is not as bad as that. Well, it's no, not. No, good news. <laughs> it's not as bad in the sense that the sort of mortality rate doesn't even begin to approach the mortality rate with Ebola, especially when I was in the epidemic in 95, when there was no treatment, no vaccine, absolutely nothing you could do for people. And so mortality was in the 80% range. This Jeez. virus is in the two to two, to 3% mortality range. Okay. So I'll take that. So, you know, because of that, people say, you know, is the coronavirus even that serious that, you know, the flu is much more of a concern? Well, uh, the average garden variety influenza, such as the one that's circulating right now in the United States, has a mortality rate of 0.1 percent. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. All right. So that makes it pretty clear. And if I may, uh, the, the worst flu of our uh, last hundred years was the 1918 pandemic, uh, which killed somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 million people worldwide and circumnavigated the planet three times in the absence of commercial air travel. That was only a uh, less than 2% mortality rate. So it had a lower mortality rate than the currently circulating COVID-19 virus. So when we hear statistics that this might infect up to 70% of the world, what does that mean? Well, it means that uh, unless we come up with amazing solutions very quickly, which I doubt, such as a vaccine overnight, practically, um, or unless governments really take the right steps to limit transmission, uh, in their countries in ways that are not stigmatizing and don't require an authoritarian state, um, we will see the majority of the planet become infected and somewhere in the neighborhood of one to 2% of them will die of the disease. Now, if we go with the low ball, uh, you take, let's say 70% of 7 billion people, 1% of that perishes, you're still talking in the millions. Jeez. It's in the tens of millions, really. That's a, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty serious epidemic. You mentioned not having, uh, doing it without authoritarian uh, controls. So how would that work out? What do you suggest? It's very, very hard to come up with a pat solution set because it's going to vary by country by country, culture by culture. Uh, no two societies are going to come to grips with this in precisely the same way. Uh, look at the situation right now, for example, in South Korea and compare it to Iran. You can't think of two more different countries than the booming youth culture, you know, uh, boy toy rock group, um, South Korea, and the very, very religiously strict Iran. But in both cases, the people put in charge of controlling their outbreaks, both have come down with it themselves. Uh, the leader in Iran who came down with it, actually was doing press conferences, coughing all over everybody, and no doubt was a spreader. The leader running the South Korea response um, was hiding his own infection until he finally acknowledged it uh, 
late last night, our time. What's in common about these two individuals? Both of them apparently acquired their infections as a result of their religious beliefs and their religious activities, which put them in close contact with other infected people in religious ceremonies. Now, it's really interesting because it means that culturally, they, even though they were in charge of trying to stop the outbreaks, they were scientifically trained individuals with backgrounds in public health and medicine. Even so, their religion superseded their sense of even protecting themselves, much less the rest of their country. And they took measures that really ran in contradiction to appropriate preparedness for a, an epidemic or a pandemic. And so there's a big lesson in there. It says that Every society is seeing this coming, but very few societies have the capacity to stare the enemy in the face and prepare the appropriate armamentarium. And I would count the United States in the, of America in the list of the unprepared. What about the idea that the coronavirus is only a real risk to the elderly or people with an already compromised immune system? Well, the hero of China's epidemic, Li Wenliang, who was the one who was the whistleblower who called attention to the emergence of a new disease in Wuhan back in December and was penalized and forced to sign a confession of being a liar by the secret police, uh, he perished from it at the age of 34, a vigorous young man, a jogger, an athlete. Jeez. So... People like anyone riding the New York subway system, how concerned should they be? Well, I think if this really hits New York, that won't even be an issue because people will stop riding the subway. It will simply clear out. Um, already, the CDC today recommended that businesses all over the United States start planning how to do operations with the majority of their workforce working from home. So I think it's pretty clear at this point that there was a, a government cover-up in China early on in Wuhan where the epidemic began. How much did that influence the uh, spread of the virus overseas? How at risk are we now because of the cover-up in China? The problem with epidemics or outbreaks uh, is there's a certain universal problem, and that is that when they are small— when the numbers of infected people appear to be, say, less than 50, uh, society at large and political leaders tend to be dismissive. What's the big deal? It's only 20 cases. What's the big deal? It's only 15 gay guys. What's the big deal? It's only 20 drug users shooting up in alleyways. This isn't a problem for the rest of us. By the time it's a problem for the rest of us, it's too late to easily control. And that was true of HIV. That was has been true of every major outbreak that slammed the planet. And in this case, the crucial window for acting was sometime between uh, roughly a week before Christmas until uh, a week after New Year's. And during that time period, the response of the government was to uh, penalize physicians who spoke publicly about it, to tell everybody, ah, it's just about this animal market, and we shut the animal market down so there won't be any more cases, and there's no human-to-human -human transmission, and it's nothing like SARS. And if you say the word SARS, you're going to be in big trouble. If you tweet about it, if you Weibo about it, if you go on social media in any way about it, you're going to be in big trouble. That was the period when they should have been acting, and they weren't. By the time uh, Xi Jinping issues a condemnation on the 19th of January to the leadership of the Communist Party, telling them, I don't want any more cover-ups. I don't want any more lies. We have to get on top of this. And any individual who tries to cover up uh, out of interest of his own career or his party um, will, quote, be shamed for eternity. Um, well, by then it's too late. By then, there are, by various reckonings from uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, from Imperial College in London, and from Hong Kong University Medical Center, um, by their various reckonings, there were already more than 20,000 cases in general Wuhan 
Uh, so, you know, the, the moment to have taken action to not only protect the Chinese people, but to protect the world from this would have been precisely when they were in cover up mode. So the who ha- the WHO has said that, you know, the coronavirus infections have peaked in Wuhan. And, uh, you know, the, a lot of the Chinese state run media, they're now taking credit for having saved the rest of the world from the coronavirus in effect. Do you think that's correct? The Chinese messages are very confusing. Uh, While some have claimed many times, in fact, as early as January 7th, were claiming that the epidemic had peaked, others are saying quite the opposite. Uh, It's interesting that Xi Jinping's own most recent statement was that there is no letting our guard down, this is a very dangerous time, anything could happen. What uh, the WHO team of independent investigators that went into China this week and just returned and held a press conference today in Geneva um, was very hopeful. They seem to think that China may indeed have turned the tide. Um, And certainly the numbers of cases being officially reported have been going down. So we have a smaller and smaller pool of new cases reported out of China each day for the last roughly 14 days. Uh, However, um, they've changed the definition of a case, how you define an an infection, a case, six times. And they've changed the definition so that it's different for Wuhan and Hubei province compared to the rest of China. Um, And it's really hard to understand how reliable any of the numbers are. Um, Perhaps one uh, indicator is that they're saying they can't do drug trials to test new experimental medicines because they don't have enough patients coming in that are infected. If that's true, that's very good news. But on the other hand, Um, Most of China has still not gone back to work. Most people are still not going to school, still not going to university, still not going to the office. Um, And so there's a lot of concern that there will be a second surge as uh, everybody returns from their uh, homes or from their distant villages and comes back into the big cities and goes to work. And then The final thing that has me a little anxious is numbers out of Beijing, because while numbers seem to be going down in Hebei, and they never really went very high in Shanghai um, or in Guangzhou, uh, they have been showing a rising trend in the capital itself. And I was in the SARS epidemic in China in 2003. I went all over the country and I I identified the market that it all started in, found the civet dealers. um, And I remember what what happened when Beijing finally admitted that they had a huge outbreak inside the capital city. And I remember how people panicked and how they got on trains and spread it all over the whole country. So... I, I would not at this moment say, oh, we can sigh relief. The worst is over in China. Well, I'm also concerned about the official numbers because I've heard reports that crematoriums in Wuhan are going over time. Yes, keeping up with the body count has proven very difficult in Wuhan and elsewhere in Hebei in the hardest hit cities. So one of the groups that's most affected by this is actually the hospital workers, the nurses, the doctors, other healthcare workers, uh, what's life like for them in an epidemic of this scale? Yeah, I mean, if there's heroes, it's the healthcare workers on the front lines. And the mortality among them has been very high. We just finally got some numbers in the last couple of days out of China that show um, early in Wuhan, the majority of cases were healthcare workers. Um, At that time, they were claiming none. Uh, And overall, nationwide in China, healthcare workers have taken the highest toll of any profession or or demographic group you might look at. Um, It's very, very, very stressful. I mean, in any any epidemic I've been in where there was a potential of, of becoming infected by treating your patients, 
uh, healthcare workers are deeply stressed. And they don't just stress for themselves. They stress on behalf of their own families, their children, um, and, and their friends. They often decide to sleep in the hospitals rather than go home because they don't want to risk infecting their families. And they go through weeks of isolation, weeks of stress that just doesn't stop. Often they are deeply sleep deprived and are uh, filled with guilt and, and, and nightmares about what they've seen and the decisions they've had to make. Because in an epidemic like this, you have to do triage. You don't have enough medicine, enough hospital beds, enough anything. And so you have to make arbitrary choices. You hope based on reasonable thinking, this patient can wait over here in the hallway. This one gets rushed in for treatment. And then you come out in the hallway and the patient is dead. It's, uh, it's, it's hard to think of very many professional pursuits that could be possibly as stressful as being either an ambulance driver, EMT person, or an active medical provider, care provider during a peak epidemic like this. I guess this is also made worse by the fact that a lot of medical equipment, uh, like the N95 viral masks, are made in China. Most of the equipment we rely on is is made in China. You go around your hospital ward and just start picking things up, you know, a box of syringes, a box of latex gloves, masks, protective gear, the ventilators, the valves on the ventilation tanks, the valves and knobs and machinery uh, that is monitoring heartbeats and so on. If it's not made in China, it's probably made somewhere else in Asia. And the supply chains are indeed breaking down. And then, of course, um, for pharmaceuticals, it's particularly acute. We may really begin to feel the effect this coming week because more than 90 percent of the active pharmaceutical ingredients used to formulate every single drug and medicine we use for any purpose in the United States comes from China. So U.S. health officials have said that the spread of the disease here is inevitable. You said earlier that the U.S. is unprepared. Can we catch up? We would have been in a better position if the Trump administration had not eliminated almost the entire epidemic response infrastructure that was created by Barack Obama. Um, its elimination leaves us playing catch up. And you, you saw that play out today on Capitol Hill as senators of the same party were attacking cabinet level individuals of the same party, all on Trump, you know, team Trump, shouting at each other. Are we ready? No, we're not. How many ventilators do we need? I don't know. How many respirators do we need? I don't know. Who knows? Who's in charge? What's going on? All of this was identified as problem areas back during the uh, Ebola epidemic in 2014. And fortunately, we didn't really have any danger of an Ebola outbreak in the United States. But just the idea of looking at that and thinking, what if we did? Who would respond? Who's in charge? What's the chain of command? How does the military fit in into the civilian sector? What is uh, uh, the law of the land regarding such things as quarantine? Well, the Obama administration appointed Ron Klain, who had been working in the Vice President Biden office, uh, to be the uh, epidemic czar, initially the Ebola czar, then sort of epidemic czar inside the White House, with the, the mandate of trying to coordinate all these various agencies that had some role in responding and, and protecting the American people and in responding overseas. And, uh, you know, we had the beginnings of a real kind of chain of command and infrastructure put in place. Uh, but th that was entirely torn down by the Trump administration in 2018. Well, with that as the background, what can listeners do to prepare themselves for a coronavirus outbreak? Well, I think there's two types of preparation. One is preparation that uh, is about your community and one is about yourself and your family. Um, on the yourself and family side, uh, it's very, very important to just think about 
a common cold. How often does one family member get a cold from outside somewhere? Your child gets it at kindergarten, your husband gets it at work, brings it home, and pretty soon the whole family has a cold. You need to think of all the ways that that common cold is transmitted in the household because this virus exploits all of those techniques. Um, and those are the things, the precautions you need to take. It's a long list. I published it in Foreign Policy, and people can take a look at the list. I specifically delineated how people can personally protect themselves at work, um, going around town, at school, and at home. In terms of your community, um, it's harder to do, but more important in many ways to engage now in preparedness. I was very stunned that this evening I took a subway home uh, from a meeting and uh, it was a very, it was rush hour, super crowded subway train. Um, and I spotted a friend and we were talking and I said that I was working on this epidemic and that I was going to be doing the Rachel Maddow show tonight. And all of a sudden people between us started paying attention. And he, my friend started asking me questions about the epidemic, and I started telling him that I thought within a couple of weeks, the subways would be empty, um, and uh, it would be a very different dynamic in New York. And this gentleman standing between us said, what epidemic? What are you talking about? There's an epidemic? I was stunned. I, it, it, so, so the first step is know your community. What is your community? Is it the building you live in? Is it your immediate neighborhood? Is it your fellow artists or your fellow photographers, your fellow musicians, your fellow accountants, whatever your profession is? Is it your church? Whatever it may be, you know, direct energies to your community and start a conversation going about, are we prepared? Get everybody in your community thinking about it. If it's your neighborhood, get the neighborhood thinking. If someone was alone in their apartment and severely ill, would anybody else know it? Who would go to help them? Who do you call? Or do you call the city health department? Does anybody know what that number is? Do you know, you know, if an ambulance is pulling up, is there, should you back away or should you assist? You need to have really specific readiness conversations and Every workplace should be on top of this. Every business should be thinking about this right now. Because if you wait until a virus is in circulation, everybody will be too emotional to focus their energy. And they'll be too crazy to make smart decisions. Now is the time to think. In your workplace, for example, how many of your employees can work remotely? If you tell the following parts of your company, work from home, can you keep the bottom line going? Can you keep productivity up in whatever the nature of your business may be? Which are the essential must be on site employees and why do they have to be on site? Is there a way to let them work from home? Is there a way to change the nature of what they do to keep them on salary, but keep them safe? And every company, every school, every business of any kind should be thinking about these things now. So the United States is a free society. China is an authoritarian state. Does that mean the China model is more suited to stopping a virus like this? Well, that's obviously the $60,000 question that we'll find out because today the World Health Organization was telling us that we should all do what China did and that China has slowed its epidemic down. We should follow their model. Well, what's that model? It's locking down 15 million people in one city, one region, locking down to various degrees 100 million people across a nation that's one of the largest physical spaces on earth. It's about controlling people's movements, throwing them in jail if they refuse to wear a mask, stopping them on the highways every couple of miles to take their temperature, forcing people to go through interrogation and temperature checks many times a day as they move around, um, finding ways to deliver food to people who are homebound, not allowed to leave their apartment for weeks on end. How would we do this in America? 
I mean, you just go through the list, every single thing I just said, we're ill prepared at best. You know, look at the situation with trying to find a place to house uh, travelers who come to the United States and uh, require a two week quarantine before returning to their home. California said, nope, you can't have them here. Alabama said, nope, can't have them here. Uh, the Alabama ruling went to a court and the judge said, Alabama has a right to say no. Well, where are we going to put people? Where's solidarity? Every state will turn into a giant NIMBY, not in my backyard. And soon you're going to see, as every role-playing exercise has shown that I've ever participated in regarding a possible epidemic outbreak in the United States, that states close their borders against other states. Truck drivers pull their guns out and say, I ain't letting you stop me because I got a, a haul and I got to get over the Rockies right now. We don't live in a society that plays well in the sandbox. And we don't live in a society right now, especially, in which Americans feel solidarity with one another. In fact, we're quite divided. We're quite filled with hate against each other. And it's really hard to see where the sacrifice and the, and the mutual care and compassion is going to come from. So the suggestion is that we should all stop hating each other and learn to work together. Well, I don't know if we can stop hating each other, but if we don't learn to work together, we sink individually, assuredly. And that's everything from, you know, people who oppose vaccination. Well, if we manage to come up with a vaccine, you better darn well get vaccinated. Uh, people who want to, uh, you know, go out to dinner and enjoy their life, go to the movies and so on, are going to find out one by one that those things are getting shut down. And as those things get shut down, what do you do with your time? How do you look in on your lonely neighbor that has no one else living with them? Who, who checks in on whom? Who looks after whom? If you have an elder in your household that is uh, in need of medication for some other disease, who goes and gets that medication? Where do they get it? How do you find it? Can you talk to your pharmacist now and build up a stockpile of necessary prescription drugs so that you don't find yourself in the position of scouring the world for them two weeks later? Um, I, I mean, I just think Americans haven't faced anything like this since 1918. And we were a very different kind of people in 1918, a very different society. People knew their neighbors, and they cared what happened with their neighbors. We, you know, uh, even big cities felt like small towns compared to the size of cities today. And it, they were manageable. Um, today, if you sit around waiting for government to take care of you, you're going to be in deep trouble. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, if anyone listening wanted to learn more about you, your writings, or where they could go to learn more about health and preparedness, where should they go? Well, I have a very bad website, lauriegarrett.com. Unfortunately, it was hacked by some Russians, so it's a mess. But uh, some of the information is there. Otherwise, uh, I much recommend that you either follow me on Twitter at laurie underscore Garrett or uh, take a look at my articles, which are, for the most part, not all of them, but a bunch of them are available on the foreign policy website. That's www.foreignpolicy.com, uh, which is a magazine I write for. And they can always check out your book, The Coming Plague, Newly Emerging Diseases in a World Out of Balance. Or if they want to understand how health systems work and why public health isn't ready, they can look at Betrayal of Trust, The Collapse of Global Public Health. Great. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, I'm terrified, and I'm going to go wash my hands. Good. <laughs> wash them a lot. <laughs> I'm becoming Howard Hughes. Thank you. Take care. Well, that's definitely a lot of food for thought. Suddenly, I feel like I need to go stock up on food. Ah, good. The hoarding. Prepping. Uh, <laughs> that, that Jim Baker's coffee. That reminds me, yeah, of the uh, America Uncovered episode. Uh that that uh, that just came out about like you know or there's there's the thing where like the the preppers are stocking the, up on like boxes of coffee packets oh. to trade for cars in the event of an apocalypse. Yes. Uh, I didn't realize that was Jim Baker, like from 
Yeah, Tam- Tammy Faye, yeah. yeah. That's what he does now. Oh, my God. But. Uh, <laughs> uh, well. <laughs> but uh, I guess. I, I feel terrified. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think for um, Lori Garrett, her, you know, she's really trying to sound the alarm for people at this point. Yeah. You know well, because I mean? definitely I, I still encounter people who are like, it's no big deal. It's nothing. Uh, you know, flu is worse. And. I did see somebody on Twitter today talk about how her husband came home and said that his office had had a meeting about what they would do when, mm. when and if the coronavirus would hit the uh, U.S., like who would work from home, all that stuff. So maybe, and actually in my day job, although because I work for in pharma, like in pharmaceuticals, so this might be a little different than mm-hmm. any other industry but you know the office was sending updates pretty constantly about the current state of the coronavirus outbreak Mm. you know that's probably unusual yeah i'm also thinking like the three of us do not have any current plan for what to do uh to keep up production for our shows and (laughs) podcasts wow this is all stuff to think about i mean i think well (laughs) you know when laurie garrett was talking about states in the U.S., like Alabama and California, not wanting to have the coronavirus patients housed there and states turning against each other. I thought it was interesting because, you know, in authoritarian systems don't necessarily stop that from happening. I saw a, a, a report about how in China, Jilin province uh, had issued an edict that you know, anybody f- traveling from Heilongjiang province to Jilin had to be quarantined for three weeks. Not anybody sick, but just anybody coming from this other province. And neither of these provinces are uh, Hubei province, where the worst of the coronavirus outbreak is. But just the idea that these different provinces are trying to keep people from other provinces out, or people from villages or cities are trying to keep strangers out. That's happening all over the place in China. So it's not something that authoritarian regimes are necessarily better at handling than the U.S. It's interesting to see that that problem happens in both places. I mean, you hear all kinds of horror stories like, I mean, the crematoriums are going nonstop. I've heard like from sources in Wuhan that like bodies are piling up, especially in rural areas. There's some rumors I've heard that I obviously can't confirm that you know, you see these videos of people being grabbed by police and put into, like, these boxes on cars. We've seen those videos, That's... but it's not clear what's happening. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, like, the, I've heard some of the rumors that, like, the reason why they're so scared is because they just incinerate those people, I... living people. I mean, those are rumors that are going around, and I can't really say, like, I would be surprised if the Chinese Communist Party is doing something like that. I think the thing is that what I have really noticed in the last week is that there is less and less talk about what's happening in Wuhan Mm -hmm. and more of the Chinese state-run media uh, apparatus moving into like different messaging about you know how they've contained the virus outside Wuhan outside Hubei province how they've successfully contained like you know the China's actions have made it so that the rest of the world is safe oh Or like in the China Daily article that came out that mentioned us, Western media like us, uh, you know, smearing China at a time when, you know, we need to be showing compassion for people. I believe they they called us disgraceful anti-China garbage. Along with the New York Times and foreign policy. Yeah, Yeah. we're in good company, I guess. But Mm -hmm. they also referred to us as leading Western media outlets. I'll take it. I'll I'll definitely take that mix. I wonder if that means I can get my Twitter officially approved. No, they don't do that anymore. (laughs) I'm sorry. But no, my point was that we we don't really, we know less and less about what's happening in Wuhan. Well, that's because it's solved. We've heard that from Chinese officials. We've heard it from the WHO. I don't know if they're saying it's solved so much as like, it's like they cut off the arm. It's like 127 hours where the guy gnawed his arm off. What is this? It's the movie where the guy goes hiking. He he cuts his arm off. He didn't gnaw it off. He like cut his arm off. Because it was trapped under a rock, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I I did not see that movie because I just couldn't bear to watch that. But yeah, that's what's happening. My point is that China is James Franco and it has cut off its arm, (laughs) which is Wuhan and Hume province. Jeez. (laughs) I mean, it, the the thing is that like we don't 
we don't have evidence of certain things happening. They're just rumors. But you have to consider that this is like a country that is, you know, for the last 20 years has been killing political and religious dissidents and harvesting their organs in state-run and military hospitals. They're putting people in concentration camps. I just interviewed a guy uh, from uh, Inner Mongolia, and he was saying that, you know, a few decades ago, they basically killed, the Communist Party killed 100,000 ethnic Mongolians. Wow. Um, And, like, I didn't know about this. You guys didn't know about this. Nobody knew about this. And it, I mean, it came out in like a book and like just people aren't familiar with just how bad things can get under that system because in within the context of the Chinese Communist Party, if you do something terrible like killing lots of people, as long as it is the politically right thing to do, you won't be punished for that. You may even be rewarded for it because the system of like what is right and what is wrong uh, is based on what the Communist Party wants to achieve, not based on, you know, the standards that you or I might personally have about what's right or wrong. Which is why I think you see now, like, I feel like the Chinese Communist Party has been very concerned about its grip on power. You have uh, the trade war causing economic problems. You had the protests and unrest in Hong Kong. Uh I, th- I think they're using the coronavirus as an excuse to ramp up the authoritarian machinery that has always existed within China and that has always existed within the Communist Party to clamp down on society. I feel like that's a little bit of a chicken and an egg thing that's going on, the, like which came first, right? Because also the authoritarian mechanisms are the only way that they have to solve the coronavirus problem. Treat. The treat like dissidents or yeah, human so, rights activists. You know, the videos that we saw of like people being like wrestled to the ground or slapped for not wearing masks in yeah. public or Or officials like soldering iron ball bars on people's doors so they cannot escape their homes. Right. Or, you know, using this kind of very like uh cultural revolution style grid management system where you have like the the lockdown starts from the neighborhood level. It's kind of the opposite of what Lori Garrett was talking about when she was like, do we know our neighbors? Do we know who, like, who needs help or whatever? And, like, now, then you'd have, like, everybody from, like, the neighborhood aunties who ha- are the neighborhood watch to, like, the Chengguan and, like, all these kind of, like, authoritarian mechanisms to kind of check up on everybody, but also to possibly weld you into your home or drag you off to a quarantine center or, you know. Yeah. It's it's very, I don't know. I guess in the end, I'd rather take my chances with the U.S. system. Yeah, I think so. And I wish we had time to have asked Lori Garrett this, but like I, like I'm really concerned. Like we did that whole episode about World Health Organization corruption and how that is putting people's lives at risk. Uh, I mean, they're saying that the World Health Organization said that. The cases in China had peaked and are on the decline, but every behavior that the Chinese Communist Party seems to be taking is not the behavior of a regime that thinks that it's in decline. Look, and until you see Xi Jinping walking around Wuhan without a mask or gloves, or uh, you know they they decide to hold the two sessions, get like I think that definitely since they postponed it those meetings that always happen in early March. The, the big government meetings yeah. they always have. Like, until they reschedule them, I think that's when you'll see them being like, okay, everything's okay now. Like, we've, I, we've I mean, weathered I'm, it. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I was looking forward to that, you know, live, you know, step-by-step coverage of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. It's really the most exciting part of the year for me. <laughs> uh, oh, gosh. Those were innocent times. I, yeah, I mean, I do feel like it's more and more after this week seeing what's happening in South Korea and Italy. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you well, want to mention kind of, what? Well, South Korea now has, um, by the time that this episode comes up, they will have well over a thousand cases of the coronavirus, the second most outside China, and, um, you know, 
they've uh, the CDC has basically raised their travel warning to South Korea for, to level three, which is the highest, which means stop non-essential travel to South Korea. Uh, so uh, Italy has uh, quarantined at least 10 villages in northern Italy where they've locked down about 50,000 people um, because of their coronavirus cases, which are the most in Europe. And Jeez. who knows what's happening in Iran? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that's another authoritarian regime that's like loaded, beset on all sides with problems. And now one more thing to add to it. If only the... Iranian boy bands could raise awareness. Oh. Uh, yeah. Well, I think, like, there's 50 people dead, at least, that they've announced in, like, a... I do not, not know how to pronounce the city. Q-O-M? Yeah, I don't know either. Uh, but, like, it's a religious center for Iran. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I think Iran will kind of have more of a China path but who knows with you know south korea what's gonna happen i think uh you know we're still not sure in a lot of ways what how it spreads exactly and it's a virus it can mutate it can change yeah Yeah. i mean so (laughs) there's kind of like a inverse relationship in viruses between how deadly they are and how easily they spread Mm mm-hmm like viruses like Ebola that are really, really deadly. They don't spread as easily. Because because, people just die and they don't spread it. Yeah. Mm. Versus like, so the common cold is spread very easily, but people don't die of it. So It's like an earworm. The common cold? Well, I'm saying an earworm is like a less deadly virus. It spreads very easily. But the mortality rate from like a really good song is still less than like 1%. We can spice up our lives and be perfectly safe. I appreciate you guys trying, but I feel like this is still terrifying. <laughs> but like, yeah, like if it's a 2% mortality rate, I mean, it's just, it sounds low for an individual. Like, oh, I have a 98% chance of getting the coronavirus and then not dying. But if you think about what the impact is, let's say, you know, New York City uh, has a, the greater New York City has a population of, let's say, 10 million people including new jersey including parts yeah, the of parts new of new jersey <laughs> right so what's two percent of 10 million it's two hundred thousand people right which is that's a lot of people to die in one flu season like that's crazy big so the impact that that would have on communities and mm-hmm. you know families and schools and the economy just like that's a huge thing deal two percent and as Lori garrett pointed out you know dr lee Wen liang he was 34 of course he was also he was surrounded a by he was a doctor in sure the hospital that was like the one of the epicenters of the corona because a lot of people were taken to that hospital first sure but like the people were like oh this is nothing very few people die it's only like the old no. yeah i mean that's not true although it is true that older people and sick people are definitely going to be more vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, if you have family members who, you know, are frail or things, you know, that's all things to consider. Um, yeah, I think it's a little different because healthcare workers are just more exposed. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think in Wuhan, they said that 500 healthcare workers had died at least. And right. again, these numbers, these official numbers. Right. But, you know, you, you have a lot of people who are, they, they're also, you know, they were running out of protective gear, all that stuff. Yeah, which is going to happen everywhere. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, but in terms of, you know, I think, you know, from what I've been reading, uh, when you, it becomes less of a trying to contain it from traveling from, China to the U.S. or something, and then you start having to try to stop the community spread of it, that's when things like making sure that you don't have, like, large rock concerts or the Olympics in Japan or, Mm. you know, these huge events where a lot of people are in close contact. 
you know, people washing their hands, like like these hygiene things will mm-hmm. become really important. Sneezing into your elbow. Yeah, sneezing. Or, or trying not to sneeze. Uh, I was walking down the street in New York, and I got like a behind a guy who was vaping, mm-hmm. and then I just got this like like the vape smoke or steam or whatever just like hit me in the face mm-hmm. uh, and i was like trying not to breathe and then two seconds later i heard him coughing oh geez <laughs> and i was like oh i wonder if you could get the cold or whatever from you know from vaping yeah. It, but like it, yeah i mean you just never know like but in new york you know like you only have to be exposed to one person who has it of course if you're a healthcare worker you're constantly exposed to like like a hundred people or more a day that that have it or potentially have it, so the the risk for them is like just so so much higher. Boy, I wish China weren't ruled by an authoritarian state that was more concerned about covering this up than actually dealing with it. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's actually interesting. You mentioned the uh, the Olympics, so it's supposed to be held in Tokyo mm-hmm. in the summer, mm-hmm. and then London offered to host the Olympics because they're like a Tokyo's sister city. Oh, really? And then, like, because, you know, London, they did it in 2012, right? So they have, like, the infrastructure to... I don't think the infrastructure is the problem. Well, (laughs) no, it's not. I mean, but it's like... I mean, that's one problem that has to be solved. But it's it's like... uh, Well, Tokyo's already building the infrastructure. Right. So you have, like, political problems, economic issues. And then the question is, like... You know, does the world want to hold the Olympics right now during a global pandemic? Well, Olympics have been canceled before. I don't know if they were canceled. Well, in 1918, the, there wasn't the Olympics. Nobody has said the pandemic word yet. Right. The Olympics, what is the difference between an epidemic and a pandemic, shall uh, I? A pandemic affects countries all around the world. And an epidemic? I mean, I don't know what the... I don't think you have to have a... I don't think that's regional or hmm. like a border can you have an epicenter to an epidemic can you have a pan center uh, <laughs> all right anyway wash your hands <laughs> yeah i mean the things that you should do wash your hands with soap and hot water while singing happy birthday twice twice uh don't share towels in your family wipe down your doorknobs uh you know that yeah like hand towels are apparently a just seething mass of germs because it's a, like a moist environment where they can grow so don't share hand towels all right yeah so yeah there you go you know all the good stuff wear gloves on public transportation wash your hands yeah you know because in new york we have basically no choice but to take public transportation yeah i mean like as a one-off you can take a car somewhere but like that's the 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 cost of doing that for most new yorkers is just absolutely impossible and if they shut down subways my gosh that would i don't know how new york would cope yeah When's the last time they shut down the subways? Hurricane Sandy. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And but that was like that was it like a very limited time period. There, there were, yeah, it was it was cut off for like less than a day, and uh, a lot of parts of it came back on fairly quickly. And even you know like the South Ferry Terminal, or whatever that was flooded, you know like that didn't affect the entire subway line. But New York City, even not including the New Jersey part. Uh, is like what eight point seven million people, something like that. Like, and how many of them take the subway on a regular basis? Right, we're talking about millions and millions of people. So I just, yeah, what is the the way to handle that? I mean, fortunately, food delivery uh, isn't happening by subway. So grocery stores are getting their food through trucks. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you stop interstate traffic, then you have a real problem for grocery stores getting food. So, I mean, yeah, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of logistics. And this epidemic in China is forcing the U.S. to, to think about, you know, how prepared we are. And I think that's a, that's a good thing 
to the extent that you know it hasn't hit the u.s particularly uh we have a little bit of time to kind of get ourselves in gear although it's not a lot of time and that's that's the whole thing when people are like oh it's no big deal it's not there's only been like 10 cases in the u.s say they're like, 40 well so exactly it's like oh it's only been 10 oh it's only been 20 oh it's been 40 now is the time to actually do the preparation not when it's a crisis yeah i mean and it's also a good time to build good habits like washing your hands all the time or disinfecting your iphone you know i thought you were gonna say disinfect your eyes no i don't look i'm paranoid and i'm not having a good time <laughs> yeah the, today's today's podcast was definitely alarming i would yeah. say yeah uh but yeah i mean i guess from our perspective having watched this all go down in china for the last since january it's kind of like do you want to watch the wave coming you know <laughs> or yeah let it hit you from behind <laughs> no i mean i think one thing that the uh, that the government can definitely do better or maybe something not to rely on the government for is just the communication about the coronavirus. I was very interested in what Laura Garrett said about um, the Trump administration removing funding for something or another, some I, epidemic. I, I, I'm curious to look into that for an America Uncovered. I think we should look into it. I think... Um, there was an Ebola czar. I remember when the Ebola czar was, uh, she was talking about that guy. An like, Ebola czar, like like a Russian czar. Like do you I'm not the know king this whole Ebola. weird like U.S. government thing about calling? It's like the blank czar. The something czar. You don't know. No, about this? I don't know. About yeah, this. it's like a they. <laughs> there's <laughs> like the crazy. security czar, health czar. Yeah, like I mean, they, they don't really they, use security, but it's like a temporary position to coordinate government departments or whatever, and they call it the blank czar. But This yeah. is what I call Russian interference in our government. <laughs> so I remember specifically when the Ebola czar was appointed because there was a lot of mockery about calling it the Ebola czar <laughs> and, uh -huh. and stuff like that. But, but czar is just a funny word, yeah, it's, and it's, it's spelled funny, you know. And uh, But they, they spell it the C-Z-A-R. Right. Not, T S A R. Right, like that's not normally the way you spell an English word. Mm, true. But so there's no longer a person coordinating that right. among all the different government departments. So, so I mean, but so I don't know what the situation is, but at least this issue is being talked about and debated in the highest levels of US government, which is a good thing because you do want the federal government to be talking about how to solve this issue. And even if not everyone agrees, it's better to at least have it be a topic of hot debate so that people can can start coming to, uh, together with different and proposals. we live in a, you know, society with a government that responds to public pressure. Yeah. Uh, the Trump administration asked for $2.5 billion in emergency funding for the coronavirus. And then wait, two point five million billion. Oh, billion. Okay. But thinking. then the Congress said uh, that's not enough. So we do live in a place where the government can be, you know, now they're now they seem to be okay. Now we're going to talk about this and what we can do about it. Mm. So, but you know, a lot of limiting community infection is stuff that ordinary people can do, like wash your hands. Mm, and move into the Canadian wilderness? Not a bad idea. Hmm. It's time for a U.S. invasion of Canada. I mean, honestly, America has some great wilderness you can get lost in as well. It's true, but is there any of that near New York City? Hmm. I guess we could move to upstate New York. We could build a China uncensored bunker. I like it. Stocked with Jim Baker goods. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, but, you know... How we have to have enough for at least like a few cars. Hey, one tub of coffee, one packet of coffee is enough for a car, according to Jim Baker. Yeah, so we're going to have so many cars, we're not going to know what to do with it. Then you can trade the cars for toilet paper. 
because that's what you're going to need more desperately than a car. Basically, don't worry, guys. We will keep making episodes well into the apocalypse. And with that, once again, I'm Chris Chapel. I'm Shelley Jong. And I'm Matt Ganesta. Talk to you next time. Wash your hands. And sing happy birthday twice. Yeah, people thought I was super weird when I was doing that in the studio today. You sing it in your head. Oh. That really should, those details need to be made clear when you're talking about a deadly pandemic. Thank Thank you you very much. I'm sorry I didn't say that you should silently sing happy birthday. Yeah, that, that would have saved me a lot of embarrassment. On the bright side, anyone who was sick or anybody else who was near you probably left. Oh, that's alone. true. If you want people to stay away from you. Yeah, just uh, sing happy birthday and cough a lot <laughs> in the public. Uh, I, I have an advantage over you guys. Already. What advantage is that? Uh, I actually do believe that I saw somebody move away from me in the subway. Because, Were you coughing? Because I was you're not Chinese. coughing. I was, I was sitting on the subway, and then there was like a woman who was standing in mm-hmm. front of me, and then she looked up, saw me, and then moved down. Maybe it's just because you're such an unpleasant person. That must be why. Uh, should we actually wrap up now? Yes. No, that was all good. I think yeah. we can use all that. So we're done. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>